We have already devoted considerable time and thought to basic definitions of hermetic philosophy. And in the, the work of last evening, we trace this through its various phases, from its religious and metaphysical implications in Egypt, uh, to its chemical and alchemical extensions in the early years of the modern world. This evening we wish to approach a different aspect, but largely within the broad coverage of our original intention. The question of the place of the original Hermetic teachings in the rise of Christianity must first be clearly stated. We must assume and accept that there is no unity of opinion on this matter. The more conservative writers are inclined to think that the old Hermetic tradition had a comparatively slight influence on Christianity. They support their position in many ways, particularly by interpretation of the Hermetic writings. Let me point out exactly what I mean by this statement. They use interpretation of their own for the simple reason the basic interpretation or basic understanding is almost completely lacking. Therefore, we are unable to say with certainty what the old Hermetic masters might have said as rela in relation to Christianity. Most of the uh, articles, books, research papers that have been done have been done from a very late date and uh, by more or less prejudiced thinkers. I do not mean intentional prejudice, but through the long medieval period where scholarship in these extraordinary subjects was not particularly uh, clear or complete, very little survived that could guide us and direct us in our modern thinking. On the other hand, we must realize that Christianity and Hermetism rose in the same general environment and background. And a study of the early church fathers indicates clearly that among the original Christians of the first three centuries, there were men and women of numerous attainments. We cannot assume that Christianity was composed entirely of simple folks. It attracted the scholars of many persuasions, and as must follow under such conditions, these scholars brought with them to the faith the background of their own general and particular learnings. Thus we may say that it would have been almost impossible for a new sect or creed to arise completely uncolored and untouched by earlier or even important contemporary influences. There can be no doubt also that among certain learned groups, groups which later became distinguished uh, in many instances for heresy, among learned groups there was a natural inclination to philosophize Christianity it became important to certain minds to orient Christianity against the background, we will say, of Platonic philosophy, or against uh, the background of Aristotelian thought. It was also in North Africa quite customary to find Christianity closely interwoven with Gnosticism, with the later phases of, the, of Egyptian religion, with Hermetic speculations, and a little later with Neoplatonism and Neopythagoreanism. The Christian of that time, well, if he was an intellectual, might not really know the dimensions of his own orthodoxy or lack of it. Christianity had not attained a strong dogmatic position. Its own beliefs and doctrines were not too clear as we find from the Antinicene Fathers. 
We must therefore accept that there was, not only probably, but almost certainly, some interchange, some intermingling of ideas in the early Christian communion. Gradually, with the passing of time, some of these early minglings came to be generally recognized and accepted as orthodox. Others of these early influences did not fit so well into the growing philosophical structure of the church. They were therefore discarded, or perhaps only ignored, out of existence. The question that perhaps interests us is the degree to which hermetic ideas may have survived, may even now be found within the body of orthodoxy, uh, acceptable, generally regarded as orthodox to the person of today. One point that perhaps is of interest in the parallel between hermetic thought and Christianity is the approach to deity which strongly differentiates and distinguishes the teachings of this mysterious ex-personality whom we know as Hermes. In one of his earlier tracts, Hermes says the universe is composed of only two qualities, the creator and the works of the creator. This statement not only survived into Christianity, unless we wish to regard it as already indigenous there, but it certainly continued to exercise a strong influence in medieval thinking and even in modern religious thought. The concept as Hermes unfolds it conceives the universe to consist of only the attributes of one sovereign power. There is nothing but God. All things that do not appear to be God are conditions of God. Deity in substance and in essence, absolute and indivisible, may not so be cognized by man, Hermes taught. Man, therefore, must observe, observe the separate works of God. And by thus observing, he falls into a possible illusion. This illusion is that these works have a separate subsistence, a true, a true and total existence in themselves. Hermes says this is not so, that all works have their existence and subsistence only in God. And extending this concept, Hermes also taught that the manifested or obvious parts of creation, even if brought together in all their diversified and apparently separate fractional manifestations, Deity is not merely the sum of the manifested parts of deity. Deity is the sum of that which is manifested and that which is not manifested. Deity is the substance, therefore, of all things knowable, all things known, and all things which have an existence but are unknown or unknowable. Hermes then gives us a statement which is very reminiscent of a familiar one, namely that in deity or in God men live and move and have their beings, and not only do they exist in God, in a world of God, surrounded by God creatures and God creations. They exist here not as visitors or strangers, or things separate and apart. So we have the hermetic thought that man shares with creation an immediate participation in the Creator. The total of things knowable must include man. And Hermes tells us that not only that man 
which is visible to the sensory perceptions, but that man which is invisible. Not only that man which is the son of earth, but that man which is the son of mind. Uh, thus Hermes gives us the relationship of parent and child as far as this can be applied to an abstract theological uh, concept. Deity is parent, total parent, father, mother. Hermes pointed out that deity is androgynous, namely possessing within itself the qualities of father, mother. But more than this pertains, partakes of a still stranger extension. For this deity which is father and mother is also the progeny of father and mother. Thus deity is father, mother, child. Deity gave birth out of itself to all things and these by their unions and minglings cause further generations and these later generations are like the original creation in God and of God. Throughout this entire concept, Hermes is essentially teaching a monotheistic theology. Yet he differs from some other schools in, in recognizing that monotheism in itself and by itself is not adequate to explain the phenomenal existence which we call creation. Therefore, uh, to Hermes it was necessary to assume that from the original and creating power and still embraced within the love, wisdom, and authority of that power, there are both primary and secondary emanations. Some creatures or creations more closely resemble deity than others. And here we come very close to some of the early Pythagorean and Platonic speculations. Those creatures first created and containing within themselves the greater effulgency of the divine power are more proximate to deity and therefore by proxi proximity attain a likeness, or by likeness attain a proximity. Both positions are advanced. Later creations, or shall we, shall we say, creations of creations of creations, depart from the original proximity, and that man which is the son of God, is nearer in a strange way in power and potential than that man that is the son of man that is the son of God. Thus by descent creation falls away from the center of its own creative power and falls into the circumference of that power. Uh, Hermes conceived the center of this power to be will or the tremendous dynamic of life and the circumference of this power to be love or the hunger of all things for their own divinity and the hunger of God to absorb into himself or itself all of its own creations. Therefore man falling away from the will of God falls into the love of God. He never departs from God but may be brought back by love to proximity again with deity. And the story of this return will be the subject of the final series, of lecture of this series, which will deal with his, the great hermetic book, The Shepherd of Men. Hermes, therefore, like the Gnostics, envisioned a hierarchy, a universe of powers, principalities, angels, archangels, thrones, and dominions. He saw not only the great fountain of all things, but uh, closely followed the Chaldean oracles 
in describing the farther fountains from the great fountains, the powers and the minds that flow forth from the power and the mind. He conceived of Anthropos, and Anthropos the son of Anthropos. He beheld in the unfolding of universal existence, the opening of a great flower, reminiscent of the vision of Dante. And as the petals of this universal blossom, this rose of the troubadours, opened in the light of the divine sun, it revealed a universe of splendid majesty, an infinitely unfolding chorus of powers hymning the eternal, and all to various degrees revealing and serving this tremendous fountain of fountains, this father cause of all that exists. From these reflections, the Hermetic teaching uh, organizes the universe into hierarchs, into descending orders of beings, from those completely divine to those possessing heroic potentials as demigods and supermen. There were not only celestial orders of deities, but there were sidereal orders, and there were terrestrial orders, and even subterranean orders, again following the Eleusinian and Orphic concepts of the Grecians. These orders of life filled all space with life, so that there was not anywhere where there was not life. The Hermetic masters of later time, particularly in the early alchemistical period, extended this thinking still further, laying the groundwork for such fantasies as the Comte de Gabelet, this mysterious story of elemental beings and creatures, and also opening the road to an extreme demonism based upon the demonism of the classical uh, world of thought. In the course of this thinking, Hermes uh, made a series of statements which perhaps are indicative of a phase of our problem. These statements have been examined, analyzed, and to a measure rejected as heretical uh, by uh, orthodox uh, Christian theologians. Let us see just exactly what these statements may mean. In attempting to support and sustain the faith of his disciple Asclepius, Hermes explained that not only are living creatures possessed by divine powers, so that all men are not only gods in themselves, but oracles of greater gods, but such extraordinary powers may be conferred upon images, likenesses, or representations of deities. These images, possessing a peculiar sympathy through likeness, and that those images consecrated to a deity and fashioned in the popular likeness of that deity and held in sincere esteem and veneration by contrite, noble, and devout persons, such images may possess virtues may become, so to say, containers for extensions of divine power, and in this way may provide oracles, may perform miracles, may in turn be accepted in the absence of the deity or in the unknowing of the deity as a proper and appropriate emblem, symbol, or embodiment, a personification of a spiritual energy. This concept certainly affected Paracelsus, who in turn affected most of the rise of medieval science and laid much of the groundwork for modern science. This thought carries with it an interesting speculation. Hermes pointed out that images erected to sanctified persons or to deities may have power to heal the sick. 
In what degree does this essentially differ from the modern concept of images in many departments and divisions of the Christian church? Hermes does not tell us that these images are gods, nor that they are false gods, nor that they should be worshipped as equivalent to or equal to gods. Hermes tells us that these images are symbols, emblems, figures, bearing witness to man's veneration of invisible powers, proximate statues in honor of remote principles. If, therefore, an individual shall create an image with the full realization that this image is a shadow of a principle and shall worship this image not for itself but as a means of focusing his attentions or his devotions upon something substantially unseen and invisible. He shall not be regarded as an idolater. He shall not be regarded as a worshiper of idols unless he bestows the spiritual power upon the idol itself, unless he regards the creature of marble, stone, or wood as having a sanctity in its own nature. If, however, he shall use this as he uses religious art to remind him of the existence of a spiritual power, and shall fully recognize that the image is not that power, but only represents it under certain conditions, and that all prayers addressed to the image are addressed actually to the power and not to the statue. Under such conditions there shall not be heresy. This is more or less accepted today, and the intercession of saints and the uh, presentation of petition to canonized persons or to representations of Christ, or the Virgin Mary, or the Apostles, shall not be regarded as the worship of images, but shall be regarded as internal reminders by which man receives an impulse to the fulsomeness of veneration, and shall therefore worship in spirit and in truth using this symbol only as a means of centering his attention upon something which is otherwise beyond the cognition of his senses. Hermes clearly makes this point, and we can scarcely deny that it has survived to us. <laughs> However, in the course of time, a point also made by Hermes came into general uh, disrepute and uh, was conveniently forgotten. This point is to the effect that such images as are made under certain conditions have magical qualities peculiar to themselves. These magical qualities not being spiritual or religious, but pertaining to sciences as yet but remotely uh, sensed and practically without our general recognition. Thus, according to Hermes, if into a figure or into a symbol there shall be incorporated certain principles of mathematics, of universal procedure, of cosmogony, of art, of musical harmony, of artistic canon, if, in other words, this image shall be made a resplendent geometrical or artistic composition, so essentially proportioned, so beautiful in its parts, so benevolent in its complexion, that it shall cause the admiration of men, then this, in, this image is not dead, for it may lead men to repentance. It may cause evil persons to ask forgiveness. It may console the afflicted and the burdened. And it may also inspire the studious to examine its proportions in search for universal truths concealed behind the actual structure and form 
themselves. Thus, according to Hermes, anything which influences man cannot be dead. Furthermore, anything that influences man and is alive, or has life of any quality in it, can not only not be dead, but it can participate in but one life, and that is the life of God. Therefore, whatever virtue there be in herbs, whatever authority there be in law, whatever skill there may be in the hand of the physician, all these things are but the extensions of the creating power into the diversity of, creating, of created attributes. Hermes, therefore, assumes that deity not only causes to come from himself forms and lives, but also relationships, patterns, interplays of forces, and that in these relationships there are also virtues, for things in themselves unchangeable appear to change or take on new mutual meanings and values because of motions. Motion is therefore a movement in interval of time or place, and interval and motion itself both are God. Out of this uh, concept a great many philosophical points uh, could be developed, but for the moment we cannot extend beyond this small circumference, as we have too many other points that call for our attention. We can therefore only summarize this phase of our thinking by pointing out that it was not correct and is not correct to assume that Hermitism is essentially pantheistic. It is not. It is pantheistic only inasmuch as it conveys life to everything but it conveys only one life, that the life of God. And in the Hermetic philosophy, there is no possibility for the existence of a principle of evil. There cannot be a demonism as we know it. There can only be that kind of a recognition of tutelary spirits, mundane and submundane, all of them in some way legitimate and reasonable extensions of the divine power, which may extend itself in ways and on levels utterly beyond human cognition. Hermes also held that because one power animated all things, that there was a continuous and endless interrelationship of things. Man is not unaffected by that which is unseen. Man is not completely unconditioned by that which is unknown. Man must therefore perceive not only with his sensory perceptions but also with his intuitive and inspirational faculties. And there are aspects of divinity moving around him and through him constantly which he cannot consciously delineate, which he cannot define, which he cannot even clearly experience. Those parts of divinity which are not within his rationality therefore move him, whereas those parts of divinity which are within his rationality he gains a certain mastery over, and by this mastery he causes movement, he causes action, thus using the conscious knowledge that he has to move what he knows, and being in turn unconsciously moved by that which he does not know. Thus man lives forever in a divine motion, a motion moving him both inwardly and outwardly. Outward motion may lead man in numerous directions, real or unreal. Inward motion leads man only to the total experience of life. Therefore, the inward motion of man is always a divine motion, a God motion. But in itself, this motion cannot be defined and can only be broadly estimated from the total pattern of the mutations of life caused by the motion of invisibles, 
through various situations and conditions, during parts of which uh, these invisibles project visible or semi-visible semblances of themselves. The next point that I think is important to us is the opinion of Hermes concerning the nature of what we term the Messiah. The Egyptians certainly had a messianic tradition. We know that in the later centuries of Egyptian religion, their form of messianic concept was drifting closer and closer to that with which we are now familiar. As early as the 5th or 6th century BC, the Egyptians had already come into the recognition of an intercessing power in nature, an intercessor, a power of salvation or preservation. And this power they variously symbolized. One of their names for this power was Iesus, a name which is startlingly reminiscent of Jesus. In the Hermetic philosophy, we do not have exactly the Christian presentation of the messianic concept. We do have, however, a concept, and one which almost certainly has played a part in the rise of Christian philosophy, as this philosophy was unfolded by men like Thomas Aquinas. According to Hermes, that which is eternal, that which has of itself everlastingness, enduring unto all generations, that which has neither a source in time nor in eternity, but a subsistence in foreverness. This power is alone in all, incapable of death because essentially incapable of birth, incapable of in any way departing from the totality of its total self, this universality cannot be divided. It is indivisible. There can never be two. Nor can it divide by some philosophical fission to become a duality. As Pythagoras had earlier taught, the only way in which division can be countenanced in the concept of a total divine power is that division is within that power, but that that power itself remains undivided. Thus, in the Hermetic philosophy, a certain division occurs within totality. And this division blazes forth, not as a separateness, not as a power brought into any possible antagonism with its own cause, but a power which is a somewhat restricted manifestation of totality. That power, Hermes calls the divine mind. He calls it also universal reason. He says that the firstborn of the infinite is the extension of the infinite itself into the field of pure cognition. Therefore, that the first act of the first creation is to uh, worship the Creator. Mind, therefore, by its natural inclination, turns toward its creator, and pure cognition venerates above all other things the source of itself. This mind, in the Hermetic philosophy, becomes the only begotten of the Father. It becomes, strangely, both the only begotten and the firstborn. And in this Hermes is in no more difficulty than some other schools. For we refer to Jesus as the only begotten, and at the same time assume that deity is the creator also of ourselves. Therefore Hermes begins to ponder the problem of the difference between the begotten and the created. Also the difference in a kind of generation, and comes to the conclusion that mind or reason is the product of a peculiar kind of creation, 
a kind of creation that is never again repeated. That in the, pro in the projection of the divine mind, to borrow an Eastern term, deity creates by will and yoga alone. The deity, by the pronunciation of a determination within its own nature, engenders within itself that aspect of itself which is mind. This mind or this cognition then becomes, strangely, the instrument of the divine purpose. It becomes the apex of the ascending pyramid of creation and the base of the descending period, uh, pyramid of the creating power. Thus, in the Hermetic philosophy, mind is a kind of savior. But Hermes was not perturbed with some of the peculiar situations that later arose in Christian theology. He was not preserved, he was not concerned with the problem of a mind preserving something otherwise lost. He was not confronted with the need for a saving mind, as we know it. He was rather in need of the concept of an instructing mind. In the Hermetic doctrine, all so-called redemption or regeneration or restoration or the transmutation of things inferior into a superior state or condition is the result of the power of the revealing mind. It is due to the fact that through the revealing or the unfolding principle of reason, all things become aware of reality. A regeneration is awareness of reality. It is not a rescuing from sin, but a restoration from not knowing. It is the creature becoming aware more and more completely of the universal reality in which it exists. By the Hermetic concept, therefore, there can be only one kind of wisdom, and that is the wisdom by which man is capable of becoming totally aware of the total existence of deity, by which man can also become aware that all diversity is an illusion, and that what we call division is merely the result of limited sensory instruments which are unable to attain a state of total cognition. Universal reason, having come forth out of the eternal, becomes next to the eternal the most immortal of all creatures. Yet this wisdom is not in itself immortal. Noose or reason or mind with its overtone in hermetic speculation, a mind which is pure cognitional reason in itself, is therefore the most aged and the most immediate of all things. Mind has a beginning in time and an end in time, but its timelessness is exceeded only by the eternity of divinity itself. Thus mind must be born or begotten, and that which has been begotten must again return ultimately to the state from which it came. Therefore, eternal reason or absolute cognition must ultimately return to the Father, must become one with the Father. For truly, any being which has experienced pure cognition has experienced the Father. And that which has experienced the Father by likeness comes under the protection and under the shepherding of pure cognition. We cannot say, therefore, that pure cognition was the god of Hermes, but we can say that it was definitely the primary symbol, the first cognizable image of that which is beyond all human estimation. This mind, this universal reason, must then be examined in its several parts, 
for it contains within itself universal perception, universal reflection, and another quality, perhaps born of the union of perception and reflection, and that is the quality of immediate experience within the substance of its own rationality. Mind must therefore, in its fullness, to return to its full archetypal proportion, contain within itself the absolute experience of itself. Reason, therefore, must lead to what perhaps we may first conceive of as understanding. Understanding being more than knowing. Understanding being an enlightened kind of knowing. A human knowing impregnated with a spark of divine knowing. Understanding must then also be the power of impersonalization of perspective. It must be the flowing of knowing and of wisdom into the conscious participation with life itself so that man understands not only intellectually but by the impact of a factual uh, significance upon himself. Hermes therefore points out that this mind possesses numerous saving attributes if we wish to regard them as saving. But salvation is now merely rescue from inadequacy. Salvation is the natural return of life up the great ladder of souls. It is the path leading by means of love through wisdom back to the one which is the sovereign of all experiences. Hermes thus divides this wisdom into a spiritual, a semi-divine, a sidereal, and a terrestrial wisdom. He has special terms for these kinds of wisdom. He assumes also, assumes also that in all the material and objective works of man, there are also patterns of wisdom. And there are various kinds of knowing, uh, marked or sealed upon creation itself. These kinds of knowing become the parents of creatures. And according to Hermes, there are men in whom are embodied uh, the cognition principle, other men in whom the reflection principle is especially strong, and a few who are destined uh, by their own achievements and by the merits of universal procedure to a state of earlier understanding by which they can be elevated uh, by certain mystical uh, avocational dedications. Uh, to the experience of God. Thus there are some who are born with a peculiar power to know men, others with peculiar power to know nature, and others with peculiar power to know God. Those with the peculiar power to know God are called religious. Those who have the peculiar power to know men are called philosophers. And those with the peculiar power to know nature are called scientists. These powers appear as a natural and innate predisposition. They can be cultivated, but they cannot be created. They can be given expression, or they can be frustrated. But there are certain lines of inevitable conduct moving in space, and these lines of conduct are embodied in groups, in persons, in nations, in races, and come into manifestation in various times and in different regions so that we are not able to say with certainty that all things are identical in their appearances or in their functions. We may, however, declare that all appearance and all function is suspended itself from identity. Hermes then goes on to explain uh, that in man's world, in the human world of things, the universal or divine mind 
becomes embodied in man himself. And Hermes divides man into two essential patterns. The first of these is the archetypal man, the total man. This total man is an image existing in cognition itself. This archetypal man may or may not be an image held in total completeness. It is quite conceivable that archetype itself carries in it the dimension of growth. But archetype also bears a strange relationship as totality uh, to its own parts, as deity, being the creator of all things, projects creation and inhabits it. So archetype, the archetypal man, the anthropos, is the source and collective unity of humanity, which is projected from it, which exists forever within it, is moved by it, and is gradually growing toward identity with its totality. Thus man, growing up in his human evolution, is fulfilling the collective archetype of man. And he accomplishes this by the peculiar process of fulfilling the particular archetype of himself. For as bodies are made of small units, such as cells and atoms, so the man archetype of, her, of type of Hermes is composed of an infinite number of units, the personal human archetypes of individuals. As these archetypes form, as it were, cells in a vast body, so this body is a kind of macrocosmic man, a great man containing in potential all the power that is necessary for the complete potency of the creatures fashioned within it. In this archetype, man lives and moves and has his being. It is a kind of strange proximate deity, not absolute and not eternal, but possessing reason and mind. Therefore we have a break in a sense between the older concepts of archetype and the modern ones. The archetype of Hermes is not merely a design upon a trestle board, nor is it a thought arising in the divine mind, because in his philosophy the divine mind cannot create a thought. The divine mind can only create a thinker. Therefore, what we term this divine thought is actually a divine thinking pattern. A pattern in itself, not only complete so far as the biological growth of man is concerned, but also complete in his psychological and spiritual growth. Therefore, if a man attains pure cognition, he attains unity with the archetypal cognition of his own kind. This is, a, this is a different approach, but perhaps in the long run the conclusions are not uh, so strange in light of other modern concerns. Where we have difficulty in finding a life inside of man, we may have difficulty in assuming a macrocosmic life also with intelligence. Hermes, of course, goes on to say that every species, every nation, every unit that exists in society must have an archetypal nature, and that this archetypal nature is the reason why this unit unfolds according to rules, and why it happens that the union of animals will not produce monsters, and why it occurs that we may expect like to engender like. And why also we have certain psychological peculiarities about groups. These group peculiarities can perhaps most easily be studied in animal life, but we are not as concerned with that. We are most concerned with the group archetypal entities in human affairs. One of the strongest examples of such an entity is nationalism or, again, racialism, and Hermes would say also sectarianism. Uh, these isms 
are actually not merely man-created things. They are things which come into existence because of conditioned energy flowing through man into his environment and molding that environment into archetype. Therefore, there are great archetypes and lesser archetypes. A man moving from one to another experiences certain changes in his own way of life. The ancients were quite certain that when a person of a certain nation moved into another nation, he must also adjust his magnetic fields and his electrodynamic structure to these new vibratory circumstances. And that only when he was adjusted to the new archetypal pattern could he be said to truly belong. For things belonging must ultimately belong to archetypes. Because archetypes alone have the energy or power to require belonging. Or to manifest the instinct of belonging through themselves. The forms do not do this. It is the archetype behind the form that exercises this influence. It is not then particularly remarkable that Hermes should use... Uh, this philosophy of archetypes uh, to a measure as Amblichus did in his development of his treatise on the gods and of the Egyptians. To Hermes such archetypes might appear to be gods. They might appear to be sovereignties. And sovereignties of this kind might well reveal the peculiar dispositions of the creatures suspended within and evolving through these archetypal dominations. Thus, archetypal deities cannot be dissimilar uh, to the peoples whom they support and from whom they receive worship. Plato perhaps gives us the same idea when he causes the world to be, to be divided among the mundane gods, each having a certain allotment we know that the Athenians regarded Pallas Athena as the patron deity of their city. To Hermes, this would have been an archetypal assignment. In other words, uh, Athena or Minerva was the archetype of the Athenians. The Athenians being a kind, not only just Greek, but a kind of Greeks. The Athenians had laws, principles, ideals, traditions, their culture was filled with this mysterious intangible mana that is worshipped in the South Seas or the Arenda of our Indians. Uh, these people belonged, and because they belonged, they lived and died in the support of that to which they belonged. And escaping from this sense of belonging were uneasy and dissatisfied. We may have a thousand other explanations for this condition today, but to Hermes, the basic meaning of this belonging was that they were within archetype and that to what, uh, what we call the folk or the collective consciousness of groups is archetypal and that these archetypes have a consciousness not merely as the existence as patterns or designs upon a tracing board even though that tracing board be regarded as the universal mind itself. This uh, concept, then, would lead uh, to uh, the concept further that, n that reason, or universal mind, this first-born cognition of the infinite, must recognize archetypes of a mundane order as dividing forces. As Homer describes the struggle between the gods of Greece and Troy, in the battles for the Trojan city. So all struggle on earth bore witness to archetypal strife. And as surely as individuals find grave difficulties in overcoming their prejudices or their opinions or escaping from the boundaries of their racial or cultural traditions, so likewise these things are dividing powers keeping the individual locked within an archetype, but forbidding him to depart into a larger pattern. 
Here Hermes conceives the rescuing power of the universal mind. He perceives that this power is not only master over the world, but master over the patterns of the world. That it is within the power of the messianic mind to liberate creatures from archetype. That it can impose upon all things one greater archetype, and that is the archetype of divine reason itself. By this means, men break away from lesser gods. A revolt against restrictions and limitations upon consciousness. And because there exists within them the peculiar power of the true mind of God, they are able, as in the Gnostic philosophy, to escape from the abyss and to free themselves from the power of the seven planets, who are representing deities of archetype, deities imposing limitation and separation upon living things, separation through classification, whereas the universal mind breaks through. It does not deny the levels of life, but it unites these levels at their apexes, or at their most common grounds of junction. It brings them all within one master archetype, that archetype being the pure substance of the divine cognition itself. Thus this mind functions as a preserving force. It may also be merit, merit to worship this mind, to adore it, to venerate it. For to Hermes, worship was merely a profound statement of acceptance. Worship implied that the individual agreed with the object of his worship, that he believed likewise, that he saw in the object of his worship an archetypal pattern that was the fulfillment of the deepest graces within himself. Therefore, worship is an allegiance. It is a giving of oneself to a concept, to a de degree of enlightenment, to a conviction deeper and more real than that ordinarily or previously held to be true. Thus man, moving by consciousness, toward universals, moved by the reason within himself, sought to break through archetype. And our entire history of civilization has been a motion from isolation towards unification to at least a partial degree. We have not achieved the end, but the natural tendency for man must perform a symbolic motion. A motion which, however, reveals by its instinctual, its instinctual direction and quality that it bears witness to a moving conviction. Conviction leading to motion moves man. And this motion is the thing which must take place in order for a condition or level of experience to be changed. Thus, to Hermes, the search for truth must involve a motion. It must involve a movement. We can think of this motion as spiritual. We can think of it as psychological. But it must receive the peculiar seal of action. Perhaps this again, as the Egyptians pointed out, has something to do with the sensory perceptions. A motion which does not include them is not a complete motion. A motion in which man moves inwardly away from them, without including them, without considering them, without giving to the body and its various aspects the proper opportunity to worship its own superior. Failure to give this opportunity leaves virtue imperfect and prevents man from a completely holistic adjustment. This again would have some conflict perhaps with our some theological systems, for man has thought of moving away from body, of transferring allegiances from body to consciousness or to mind. He has hoped that perhaps he could leave this body behind like some empty shell upon the shores of the sea of time. 
Hermes says, no, the body cannot be left behind. The body is the younger brother who must be carried along. We must take the body by the hand and lead it with us. For it has a destiny of us and in us. It has a kind of contribution to make. And perhaps this was the secret of the hermetic science adapted to the speculations of alchemy. For in alchemy there was distinct emphasis upon the importance of the most neglected of all elements. One of the early hermetic alchemists said that those who seek the mysterious magical agent, the proper material, the first material of the wise man's stone, nearly always fail to find it because they look for it in distant and difficult places. Another writer says, those who would achieve the great elixir, the universal medicine, must realize that its basic material is with them from the cradle to the grave, that it is never distant from them, that it is nearer to them than any other object that exists in nature. And this same writer says that even more humble than this, the very excrement from this near thing is richer than any foreign substance if we seek the material of the stone. The only possible implication from this is that in some way the basic material of the hermetic mystery must be man's body. The, it, it is the only thing which can answer the requirements of the various definitions that are given. This mysterious thing must be physical. It must be composed of elements. It must contain within itself the seeds of life. It must have motion and animation. And it must be closer to man than anything except his own soul. The impl implications become increasingly obvious, for the only thing that can be so close and still physical must be the body. And the experimentations as they unfold justifies this thought. Therefore in the hermetic mystery, body has something to do with the regeneration or perfection of man. It is true in the hermetic arts that it is the power of the mind to protect and preserve body. But it is not necessarily true that the body can make no contribution to this larger purpose. In his discourse to his son Tatian, Hermes explains that the humblest of things must not be left out. For as surely as the great may contribute to the greatness of things, so surely that which is most humble, that which is least of all, must likewise contribute or completeness cannot follow. What then can the body contribute? And here Hermes gives us a few more a rather interesting pointers. Body can contribute symbolism. It can contribute a kind of action, an action perfected by art, an action which we find perhaps most nearly approached in the artistic canons of men like Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo never regarded the body merely as the house of life. He examined it. He measured it. He estimated it. He came to numerous subtle calculations. He divided it into an infinite number of parts, these in turn, turn divisible. He originated a concept of the ultimate eternal repetition of parts, a concept which has been preserved to us in the theory of dynamic symmetry. Namely and factually, Every part of the body blazes forth with the emblems of universal law. And like the mysterious vision 
of the Greek philosopher. It stands as an heroic figure, its body covered with levers of fire, and its entire structure held within a strange framework of geometry. This body, then, must make its own peculiar contribution. For as surely as the image, because it is held sacred, may have a virtue, so surely the body, recognized in its true nature, has a virtue. And one of the virtues of the body is its power to release man through an experience of total body consciousness. Now this is not necessarily consciousness of body. But man has been given several books, even from the Hermetic Arcanum, by which he may know the divine. One of these books is nature, one is holy writ, and one the human body itself. Paris also said if man would be wise, he must study his own body. For the proper study for mankind is man as a total experience. Hermes was convinced that the body was a kind of magical formula and that those who could read it rightly and use it properly possessed a secret knowledge not to be otherwise attained. Furthermore, this body, acting, brought into motion under law, and by consciousness, assumed certain attitudes, became mathematically and harmonically adjusted. Much of this is con contained in the abstract, abstract concepts of Hatha Yoga, where there is a peculiar and particular virtue in the positions of the body in relation to health, and also in relation to consciousness. And the body, assuming certain postures, and brought into a certain degree of refinement, and brought under a certain mastery by consciousness, becomes an indispensable part in the accurate and correct performance of the Hatha Yogic disciplines. In other words, it would be fair to say that certain spiritual ends attained by Hatha Yoga could not be attained if the person practicing it was not embodied. There was an ancient Egyptian adage that all new experience must come to man during embodiment, and that in the periods between embodiments he reflected and gradually assimilated and digested experience and built it into power, but that new experience must come through body, and therefore that the release of man into certain levels of conscious experience also required the cooperation of body. Thus man not only must redeem life, but he must also redeem body, for body is merely a form of life. And just as surely as man is a citizen of a divine empire, he has another empire over which he is master. Let us assume for a moment uh, the hermetic axiom, which is derived from the uh, Babylonian Hermes, Nebo, who was called the god of the writing table. This deity paralleled very much the thinking of the famous Hermetic axiom that was written on the Emerald Tablet of Hebron. On this tablet it was stated that all superior things are like unto inferiors, that all inferior things are like unto superiors, that things differing in multitude and magnitude are still bound together by a common sympathy of design which is indissolvable. By the same token Nebo says, that which has been shall be. That which is somewhere is everywhere. Therefore man, recognizing himself as a citizen of the infinite, views himself as one small part of a great empire. He looks around him and beholds a total population of creatures like or similar to himself. He also perceives other species and genera different from himself. And he becomes aware of many creations abiding around him. And he sees himself as a citizen of a vast form, a great body with its roots in space and its branches unfolding into the mystery of time and generation. 
So surely as man is a citizen of a greater empire, so man is master of a lesser empire. It would be as wrong for man to depart from the empire of his own body as it would be for God to depart from the empire of space, and equally impossible. Now all beings have natural approach and departure from formal matters. But in the inner constitution of man, those years which constitute his normal span represent a vast cycle of growth and opportunity for the creatures that are his citizens, the creatures of his world. And these creatures are not only the visible creatures or those which can be estimated by scientific means, not only the various cells and atoms, but invisible creatures inhabiting galaxies of these atoms, beings so vast that they themselves are godlings ruling over orders of cells and ruling over orders of processes and serving faithfully as superintendents and overseers guarding the functions and the restorations of the human body. These lives are not separate from man. He furnishes them an embodiment. But if they become disembodied, they do not die, nor do they depart from man. But they return to man, and they await re-embodiment. Thus there is a vast evolutionary process in which the body plays a part, and man cannot escape from the evolution of the cell life within himself. His release results from his releasing those things that are parts of himself. Therefore his emancipation, his final liberation from his humanity, means that he has also brought up to a certain level of attainment to a degree of revelation and liberation suitable to themselves all the life that is dependent upon him and upon which he must bestow a sacred obligation. So Hermes ties man to the body. He ties man to the degree that man cannot escape except by perfection. He also implies that what we call ethical procedures what we may term scientific methods, what we might broadly describe as such sciences as nutrition, or physiology, or even anatomy, are really sciences by which man learns to become a good and just ruler of his own empire. Thus Hermes, in his book for the instruction of kings, writes not merely for those who rule nations, but for those who seek to exercise proper rulership over the compound structure of themselves. The man who is a despot to his own body will never attain the idealistic liberation which he hopes. Man must bring with him the least of himself or remain behind with that which he has left imperfect. Man cannot depart from his humanity until he can take with him the total of the parts of himself. And this totality includes those parts which are extended into matter. Man therefore can cast off a physical body, but he cannot cast off his responsibility to body archetype. He can only bring it to perfection with himself. He cannot outgrow it it must outgrow the need for him. And this it accomplishes through his assistance, through his wise and effective administration of that empire which is himself. By the next step, man, belonging to a society, must ultimately bring that society together. For there is no release from archetype except outgrowing of, our, of archetype. If, therefore, there be a complete archetype of humanity, there can be no true substantiation of this archetype, no total fulfillment of it, until all humanity occupies its proper relation to the archetypal pattern. 
This means that all differences between men must be overcome, that amity must be established. And until such time as this occurs, the continuance of differences requires the infinite continuance of an existing condition. There can be no change without remedy. There can be no release without growth. Man can escape from nothing, but he can outgrow everything except God. And when he outgrows all other things, he returns to God, which, who is the proper and internal source of growth. If then we conceive that reason is the shepherd of men, is that power by which the individual is enabled first to cognize his own existence, and second, recognize his own need. Reason, therefore, provides him with the indispensable instruments of his own salvation. He is saved not from ill, but from the state of not being saved, which in this is the common ill. For while man is not yet complete, he is torn between the imperfections of his knowledge and the internal inspirational impulses toward completeness. He is torn because prematurely completeness is not even attractive to him. Yet he cannot evade it. Therefore he is moved remorselessly along the way toward total enlightenment. And this emotion is universal. And we have some concern and agitation at the present time over the possibility that our present atomic, atomic researches may result in the decimation of our species. We are worried that we may cease before we are perfect. Let me warn you and assure you that your fears are groundless. Nothing can end its labors until it has completed the purpose for its own existence. Therefore, it is conceivable that man by his ingenuity might destroy a kind of world, might destroy a kind of race, might devastate a planet, might even force it from its orbit into chaos. But none of these, even so-called tragic things, can in any way change the requirement of man for man surviving. All vicissitudes is still responsible for the government of his empire, and somewhere space will provide him with the environment necessary to, to growth until growth is accomplished. Now growth in this tie, kind, and the hermetic meaning of growth, as we find it in alchemy certainly, is not exactly the kind with which we are familiar in the developing of garden plants or even in the upraising of the young. Growth is, is a, another kind of thing. Growth is a qualitative fulfillment. Growth is the thing becoming itself. It is that which removes all limitation upon self. Growth is not an addition of that which is not natural. Growth is the achievement only of that which is inevitable. A thing does not become necessarily more by growth. Rather, we may say, it becomes whole by growth. Growth does not increase the number of the parts. It increases the unities of parts. Growth does not remove uh, the evil of its own absence. It merely removes intervals by means of which things lose their dissimilarities and find it possible to reunite or to coalesce in a more complete and harmonious manner. Therefore, growth is an increasing awareness by means of which we are able to reconcile dissimilars and gradually come to the realization of identities. Growth in this same sense of the word um, generally appears to us as a means of enlarging our abilities. Actually, this is not the truth either. It is not the enlarging of the ability that is achieved any more than it is the increase of knowledge. 
what we have done is to overcome debility or disability. We have not added to knowledge because knowledge is eternal and knowledge is forever and knowledge is total. But we have removed intervals between ourselves and knowledge. Therefore, growth is the setting up of a situation by which ever-increasing normalcy may be attained on the various levels in which growth, growth is specified. Growth toward God is not a motion nor an enlargement. Uh, growth toward God is a gradual removal of interval through realization, through understanding, and through the unfoldment of conscious powers. Hermes, then, gives us a universe in which all things are moving uh, toward the completeness of their own parts, and in so doing, achieving what we like to term evolution. Evolution is really the overcoming of discords on all levels. The body becomes normal when its discords are overcome. Normalcy is not a remarkable state, nor is it a superior state. Normalcy is the natural state, which has been obscured by various forms of ignorance or excess. Man cannot create normalcy, but he can correct abnormalcy. Man cannot cure the sick, but he can remove the causes so far as possible by which sickness is able to endure. Health is not a particular end which men may sometime attain. Health is nature's norm, which by circumstances of one kind or another, sometimes obvious, sometimes subtle, sometimes caused by indiscretion, sometimes perhaps resulting from heroic self-sacrifice, but always sickness must result from the fact that normalcy, for one reason or another, has been unbalanced or has been prevented from manifesting itself. The person who works himself to death is a martyr because actually he is sacrificing normalcy which is health perhaps in a cause greater than himself. Still, however, he will be rewarded for the merit of the cause for which he worked, but he cannot escape the limitations imposed upon the flesh by its own laws. Therefore, all good men do not have to be healthy. But no man can be truly healthy who is not also the good man, having within himself a true and proper enlightenment concerning values. And health, in a way, is righteous government over the population of our material empire. And where it is endangered, we must rush to its assistance with every possible and available means. Not because we simply want to be well, but because we have an obligation to universal life, and we want to meet this obligation in every possible way that we can. Hermes then tells us something about punishment and reward. And here again, we may see traces and evidence of a relationship between old doctrines and new. Hermes had no concept of hell. The Egyptians did not know it as we understand the term. Most peoples of antiquity had but a dim vision of it. Some had a comparatively extravagant notion, but this only upon the outer surfaces of themselves. Their deeper and more mystical schools nearly always recognized symbolical meaning rather than literal meaning. To Hermes, uh, as to Plato, hell or perdition or punishment uh, represented the condition of a soul in bondage. It represented the individual who had not gained ascendancy over the total economy of himself. That being who is not able to posit his rationality in such a way that it is his guide, his leader, 
and exercises a kind of determinism. The individual who is not master of certain processes of his own life must be regarded as a slave, and hell or punishment is slavery to mental, spiritual, or moral infirmity. Hell is the condition of the individual who lives without attempting to attain unity. Hell is the discord of diversity in function, in attitude. It is confusion. It is pandemonium. And it expresses itself most commonly in the most obvious and simple evidence of confusion, and that is fear. That individual who has not been able to establish value, has not established a core consciousness within himself, has not devoted his mind and his thought to such arts and sciences as give him dominion and at the same time give him earnest responsibility. Such a person must be under the condition of fear. Fear is unreasonable doubt concerning providence. Fear is founded in a belief in accidents. Fear exa exaggerates the power of things over principles. Fear is natural, where man looking from himself sees confusion and not unity. And furthermore, looking from himself, observes in the conflict of parts a variety of misfortunes, and further contemplates the possibility that he may himself be involved in these misfortunes. Therefore, fear must be in that mind which has not a goal, a purpose, or a plan. The mind which is aware of the principle of the universal creator cannot abide in fear. Therefore, one of the primary purposes of divine mind, or universal reason, is to bring man into a rational cognition of destiny, to reveal to man his inescapable place in a plan, that he is and must always be a creature of purpose, that truly, in this plan, the plan itself cannot be solved cannot be completed, cannot be consummated, until fear ceases in every existing creature. One fearful creature leaves one part of the inevitable imperfect. Therefore, the very power which traditionally is said to mark the sparrow's fall, this same power decrees that in this universe there is nothing to fear but fear. And furthermore, that fear is proof that man has not attained inward penetration, that fear is the victory of defeatism over faith, that fear is the acceptance of division, whereas the achievement by rational illumination of the fact of unity relieves man from all unreasonable fear and places him in a universe of eternal progress in which he can never be less but in which he has the power through the unfolding of rational consciousness to become more in the sense of having more awareness of that which is. Hermes then considers redemption or the saving power of grace, as a kind of victory, not only of reason or rationality over fear, but of love over fear. Now the difference between love and reason is of peculiar quality rather than essential nature, because the heart and the mind, originating in one source, must at their root be identical though in their manifestations they appear divided. The reunion of these parts must also be attained in the course of the great hermetic experiment. In man, love is not merely the mutual affection 
nor a kind of regard of one creature for another, nor is it based upon affection for outward appearances, nor even for mental or emotional attributes, nor for character alone. Love is of itself a kind of spiritual agent. It is a power. It is a transmuting force. And the reason for its tremendous value lies largely in the fact that it enables man to escape the pernicious pressure of egoism. Now egoism has its place in the philosophic empire. Man must pass through the experience of self-existence. But having passed through this experience, he must not linger. For intensive egoism is bound to transform itself from a helpful factor at one stage of growth to a pernicious factor at another. Egoism or egotism helps man to gather the lesser parts of his own nature into an identity. Therefore, in himself or as selfness, he brings his empire into one-pointedness. At the present time, this empire, like most political states, is not equally represented. At this time, there are not only unrepresented minorities, but there is the vast unrepresented majority. That, in this case, being man's egoism, ignoring the requirements of his physio-psychical nature. Thus man has turned his democracy into an autocracy and established egoism or egotism as a dictatorship of self-will over both body and environment. This is not the purpose, however. Ego must be tempered and must regain its sense of responsibility. It must realize that the one that would be greatest among parts must also be the servant of all and that ego is never complete in its purpose until it has redeemed the least parts of its own compound nature. But having achieved the unity of internals, having brought its own parts into conformity, into uniformity, into final partnership, having diffused its own consciousness as a mystical experience through the cell structure of its own body, Ego must then face a larger challenge, namely that it must sacrifice its own identity or it can never achieve absolute identity with eternity. The world is not saved if 2,750,000,000 human egos remain separate beings. It may be saved from something less, but it is not saved from a greater need. Thus egotism, resulting in innumerable egotistic institutions and structures, uh, can ultimately frustrate archetype and can prevent the union of divided parts. Thus beyond a certain point, ego must be released, relaxed, and allowed to escape, escape from the driving power of necessity, which is its principal motivation. Ego, according to Hermes, was driven by necessity, an outrageous goddess. Necessity, in turn, forcing ego to certain attainments, ultimately forces ego to relinquish these attainments by a larger necessity. Necessity exists while man must struggle for survival. And the final symbol of this struggle is the survival of his individuality. Man must sometime, however, waken to the fact that the struggle for survival is an illusion because it is utterly impossible for him not to survive. Survival for him, however, does not have this broad philosophic implication. For most persons, survival means merely the continuance of a present state. Here, unhappily, ego is of little use for it cannot preserve man from the changes of his estate, nor can it prevent change in nature. 
Thus, beyond a certain point, ego turns upon man and destroys him. And this is Bernie's uh, concept of the fall of the angels. Lucifer representing ego, the brother of universal mind, rebels against heaven and is finally cast into the abyss by Michael, the psychopompus of the army of the Lord. Thus ego must find, ultimately, either a voluntary relinquishment or it forces the individual to an extremity in which a violent procedure seems to be the only possible course. Ego, however, by its own nature, is not too difficult if man will permit it to be itself. Ego is perfectly natural and perfectly normal in a situation. It is when it is moved out of that situation, or something is expected of it contrary to its own nature, or it is forced to preserve that by which by its instinct it does not wish to preserve. Then, under the pressure of will, ego becomes a pernicious circumstance. The relinquishing of ego, therefore, becomes the higher discipline of Hermes as it was in India, Egypt, China, Greece, and many other areas. The relinquishment of ego is the gradual breaking down of the barriers of mental isolation by which things are even more totally divided than they are by physical isolation. That thing is truly separate which is mentally apart. And as surely as mental separation is a more terrible problem than physical, so surely mental union is a greater blessing than that of any other kind. Mental in this case does not mean intellectual, scholastic. Mental means union on the level of idea, union on the level of pure intellection. And the moment man is confronted with a challenge to depress the power of the ego, he finds an ever-present agent working for him and with him. And this agent is love. And love, according to Hermes, is one of the primary fields of the divine nature. For love of all things forces upon man uh, the importance of the not-self. Love causes the individual, first of all, to place value above self. At first symbolically, by transferring his attachment from himself to another. Love causes him to work industriously for a profit not for himself, but for the objects of his affection. Love leads him into civilization. Love begins the restoration of unity by the establishment of the home. Love progresses this restoration by the foundation of the ecclesia, the assembly of those who are devoutly united in spirit. Love also gradually turns man from the adoration of things inferior to the veneration of things superior. Man unfolds and evolves from the fear of God to the respect for God. From respect he advances to admiration, from admiration to awe, and from awe finally to simple love. A love which transcends all of the more spectacular attitudes which he may hold. Thus man, seeking for final union, finds that even the mind itself, even cognition, even reason, the only begotten, is itself in a kind of lesser division from totality. And that which cannot be bridged by consciousness is bridged by complete self-forgetfulness in the service of that which the mystic Sufi calls the Beloved. Thus man, unaware of his own motion, makes the final step to God by not even desiring the step, but by becoming completely immersed in total affection for that which is divine. By this means he does, through perfect love, achieve that unity which he first contemplates and later embraces by an inevitable gesture of his own desire. 
these in substance represent certain phases of the doctrine of Hermes which have to a measure Christian parallels. Parallels which are not always obvious, but I think we have selected those points in the Hermetic doctrine which have the greatest uh, provocative power in causing us to consider or contemplate as to the possibility of an interplay, an interrelation between these doctrines. And also, we can also say, perhaps they indicate Christian influence on Hermeticism. In any respect, they represent universal beliefs or ideals which are expressed in the Hermetic writings and which prepare the way for the shepherd of men or the great discourse in which Hermes, uh, coming into the presence of universal reason, receives from reason the revelation which is the light of the world. And I think that covers our problem and our time for this evening, so we thank you very much.